lot of people want a lot of the same thing at the same time. That's peak demand. And when the demand is for electricity, it causes peak loads on the country's electricity supply system. But the demand for electricity is not constant at all times of the day and night. Large amounts of electricity cannot be stored. But we can store water and use it when needed to drive turbine generators. In the highlands of Scotland, hydroelectric stations have been built to use the water of the glens. Here at Nidlochry, a typical run of river station uses the water of the tunnel to meet base load conditions. In Glenshira, a two-stage scheme uses the waters of the hills of Lorne. And beside the banks of Loch Lomond, a peak load station uses the waters of Loch Sloy. Hydraulic machines, machines driven by water falling under gravity, are highly responsive and may be started within minutes to meet heavy loads demanded very suddenly. A load increase of hundreds of megawatts in five minutes when we all stop watching television and turn on lights or electric kettles. Or a thundercloud moving unexpectedly over a large city, causing many lights to be turned on at once. Hydro plant is cheap and rainfall is free. But collection and storage capacity to cover the wide variations in load and unpredictable rainfall can be provided only by large and expensive dams. What if we could put the water in the reservoir cheaply to be available when we need it? Britain has a greater concentration of nuclear power stations than anywhere else in the world. And in Scotland, we generate more nuclear power per head of population than in any other country. Nuclear stations are expensive to build, but their running costs are very low. These and the new fossil fuel fired stations have energy to spare at times of low consumer demand. The use of which would avoid the expensive shutdown costs and slow start up disadvantages of steam driven plant. This is the energy which can put water pumped from a lower level into a reservoir. There it can be stored so that when the peak demand occurs, it may be recovered again as electricity through hydraulic turbines. At Kruachen, cheaply produced off-peak energy is used to pump water from Lochor up to a reservoir in the hills, there to be available without delay when the demand for electricity is greatest. Not all the energy used to pump up the water is recovered when the water is used for generation. But even at an efficiency of 75%, the generated energy is cheaper than that produced by other means at times of high system load. A site suitable for the construction of such a scheme was found among the hills of Argyll. The high quarry on Ben Kruachen offered an ideal upper reservoir, easily dammed, and within short horizontal distance of the necessary lower reservoir, the 15 square miles of Loch Hall. With scenic beauty all around, which Highland hydropower development has always treated tenderly, and with ruined reminders of the great Scottish clan whose war cry was once Cruachan, sighting the station in the heart of the mountain would mean that when the construction scars had healed, there would be little left to be seen and nothing to offend. Ben Kruachen and many of the surrounding hills are part of an extensive and massive intrusion of igneous rock, mostly in the diorite and granite groups. On the south side of Kruachen, the granite complex is overlaid by older phyllites. The rock in general was found to be of good quality. A three-mile macadamized road was constructed up the steep slope of the mountain to provide access to the site of the upper reservoir. Preventive measures were used to restrain large boulders from rolling down the hillside 
And while civil engineers planned for work above and below ground, mechanical and electrical engineers were studying problems of design. Runner tests on homologous models would show if the same hydraulic machines could be used as pump and turbine, so cutting the cost of plant, at the very high head which Kruerken made it possible to use. The single reversible runner would have to be capable of lifting 6,000 gallons of water per second through 1,200 feet in one stage, much higher than had previously been attempted. Efficiency tests on model after model resulted in hydraulic profiles so well suited to both modes that the product efficiency equaled that of some alternatives using separate pumps and turbines. The precision with which the components of power may be measured using electronic speed measuring devices and dynamometer torque meters of high absolute accuracy combined with easily calibrated water measurement enabled the efficiency to be demonstrated to the consulting engineers with far greater accuracy than on full scale tests. High-powered full-head models were used in the cavitation test program to confirm the indications of low-head measurements. Suppression of the damaging cavitation bubbles, more exacting with a pump than with a turbine, needed a Thoma number of 0.15, corresponding to a runner mounted 150 feet below the level of the loch. This is deep, but with an underground station not expensive to provide. Guide vanes control the admission of water to the turbine blades. But when the machine is running in reverse as a pump, these guide vanes are subjected to severe buffeting. The impulsive water loading is measured by fitting strain gauges to the veins of a model pump. Water will be thrown off the runner with enough force to fling itself 1,500 feet into the air. From the information thus obtained, Fatigue tests on a much larger scale would confirm the ability of the veins to withstand the hydraulic loading. Starting as a pump means studying the conditions in the runner when the suction cone is only partly water filled. The starting pony motor, one tenth the size of the main motor beneath it, cannot start a pump full of water. The water must first be blown down clear of the runner with compressed air till the water drag is reduced to windage. The motor speeds up and is synchronized to the supply system, and then the water in the suction cone must be slowly readmitted to the runner. Its inner edges flying round at over 100 miles an hour, one moment in air, the next in water. Through this transparent casing, the behavior of the water is under observation 
so that the rate at which the air is let out and the positions from which it is abstracted can be chosen to produce the best control of the admission of the water. Fatigue under torque loadings, variation of axial hydraulic thrust, and measurement of guide bearing loads were among the many tests conducted during the substantial program of laboratory research. The final design passed all these tests. The building of the world's first high head reversible pump turbine installation could go ahead. Underground power stations may show economic advantages. Their excavation and construction present many problems. The complex of tunnels, adits, chambers and shafts, which were completed in two years, involved the removal of 290,000 cubic yards of spoil. Each stage was carefully programmed so the blasting and mucking out could proceed in different areas simultaneously. Rainfall in the catchment area of eight and a half square miles is diverted to the upper reservoir by 12 miles of aqueduct system, partly tunnel and partly pipeline, and contributes some 10% of the station output. Some 15,000 feet, or nearly three miles, of tunnels were driven through the granite for the underground works. The main access tunnel was driven first, dropping at a maximum gradient of 1 in 19 to the machine hall two-thirds of a mile inside the mountain. Into the area designated as the site of the machine hall, trial tunnels were driven to establish the final location. These tunnels were then enlarged to form the springing of the future arch of the machine hall roof. After the concreting of the arch, the main excavation was taken out in benches. seen here from the east end of the machine hall is 120 feet below the surface level of Loch Hall. Smooth blasting, a technique which does not shatter the new rock face revealed, was employed along the side walls of the finished power station where panels of rock have been left in their natural state. Shaft raising was done by the Alimac method. By this device, a working carriage for men and equipment climbs up a rack rail bolted to the surface of the rock. These water shafts between the dam and the power station incline at 55 degrees so that they'd be self-mucking.
The machine hall represents a major feat of excavation, 300 feet long, 77 feet wide, and 120 feet high. The upper reservoir was created in a quarry formed in time long past by glaciation. The massive concrete buttress dam would rest on granite, and though the rock is jointed, it is not weathered, and only small quantities of cement were absorbed in the grout curtain. The early stages of construction were carried out against the picturesque background of winter snows. Ben Kluachan reaches 3,689 feet above sea level, and the higher slopes carry a mantle of snow for nearly six months of the year. The central gravity section incorporates the intakes to the two inclined shafts. Two 16 and a half feet diameter low pressure steel penstocks, each with a control gate and a bulkhead gate to permit maintenance to be carried out, will convey the water through the dam. These two main shafts bifurcate at a depth of 800 feet into four high pressure shafts of 10 feet diameter, tapering to 8 feet, each supplying one of the four machines. The hydrostatic pressure at the foot of the shafts is of the order of 600 pounds per square inch. Kruachen is designed to operate on a weekly pump storage cycle. The frequent and rapid fluctuations of reservoir level to be experienced when operating a pump storage scheme will induce a daily fluctuation of stresses in the dam. No fund of experience existed for these operating conditions at the design stage. So the maximum stresses allowed for had to take account of operating probabilities. The calculated maximum principal compressive stress due to water load with the reservoir full does not exceed 250 pounds per square inch. And a factor of 10 allows for temperature and secondary stress conditions. In the application of this design, Kruachen is again a pioneer. After the paperwork, the woodwork, then the metalwork. The pump turbine runners are stainless steel castings. Each of the four sets will generate a hundred megawatts. Two of the machines are designed to run at 500 RPM and two at 600 RPM, resulting from differences in design details as established by the two manufacturing companies.
hand finishing was necessary to bring to the work exactitude of form and fit. The product hydraulic efficiency proved to be 84%. In a project of the magnitude of Kruachen, there are many contributors to the success of the finished result, and a vast range of plants and manufactured items is required. The scroll-shaped spiral casings were fabricated by welding together steel plates. To prevent distortion, the workpiece is preheated and maintained at a constant temperature during welding. Afterward, the piece is stress relieved. For reasons of transportation, the casings were made in two halves and bolted together on site. Ultrasonic, magnetic and radiographic inspection techniques were used and pressure testing was carried out. Great strength is needed to withstand the test pressure of 1.8 times the maximum likely to be met in service. After reassembly on site, further tests would be carried out. The top and bottom covers are cast in steel and fitted with renewable runner seal wearing rings. These covers also form bearing units for the water guide vanes. In one pair, the covers have fitted locking bushes for use when pumping, actuated by high pressure oil. generators for Kruachen, the figures of MVA per pole are among the highest in the world and represent a notable achievement for British industry. Braking is by friction pads, applied when the machine has run down to 20% speed. After full assembly, works tests included determination of losses, temperature changes, reactances, airflow and noise level. The stator was split into three sections for transportation. The three phase transformers, of which there are two, each serving two sets, are water-moderated oil cooled. For movement to site, it was necessary to dismantle them after test because of weight limits on the road approaches to Kruachen and the gauge limits of the access tunnel. A daring and novel expedient. single-core, oil-filled, high-voltage cables designed to withstand an internal static oil pressure of 450 pounds per square inch. The conductor is aluminium-wrapped, wire-armored, and encased in a PVC sheath. Cables seem to be constructed on the pattern of an onion, layer after layer after layer. But the pattern of their making can be beautiful to watch. A 
Open type air blast circuit breakers and switch gear will be the vital link in the electricity export import system. Some five miles east of Kruachen, near the small village of Dalmelli, a new switching station was constructed. An earlier reporter writing of this area describes it as winding for miles through woods and dells, presenting such varied and agreeable views of water, of islands, of towering mountains and sloping hills as give an unusual grandeur and sublimity to the landscape. The site clearance of peat bog provided the unusual, but perhaps hardly the grandeur of that earlier description. It is from the slopes of Ben Kruachen itself that the grandeur can best be seen. Around the shoulder of the mountain to Dalmalley flows the power from Kruachen. And then, 50 miles to the outskirts of Glasgow, the south of Scotland, and the national grid. At its highest altitude, the line reaches 1,800 feet above sea level. Special tensioning equipment was employed to keep the conductors clear of the ground during erection and much of the work was carried out under conditions of winter snows. Snow cats, similar to those used for polar exploration, were used to assist movement and act as mobile winch gear. Mountain and bog and locations remote from roads presented their own special problems in the construction of the overhead line. Discharging over 8,000 tons of water a minute into Loch Awe and abstracting it again without injuring the fish meant an enormous outfall structure carrying 6,000 square feet of steel mesh screen to limit the velocity to not more than one foot a second. The fluctuation of water level of Loch Awe caused by the operation of the plant is only a few inches. Excavation and concreting of the four bay wing walls and screen supports 
was carried out inside the sheet steel piled coffer dams. In driving the piles to a required depth, compressed air units and diesel hammers were adopted, depending on the nature of the ground. While in some locations, electrically driven vibrating hammers were used. A circular coffer dam 50 feet deep and 85 feet in diameter was constructed to enable the outfall to be excavated. Bored concrete piles were used for part of the coffer dam structure and the circle was completed in sheet steel piling backed by a concrete wall which was underpinned in lifts as the excavation work progressed. The 3,200-foot-long tail-race tunnel enters the outfall area by an upward-inclined shaft and discharges through a flared portal fitted with a sliding bulkhead gate. In the deepest part of the wing wall coffer dams, heavy bentonite mud was used to stabilize the ground and excavation and concrete work was carried out through the slurry. Elsewhere, base concrete was placed under water using large pre-cast concrete blocks and end shuttering. Accurate placing of each block was ensured by the use of guide frames. In place of normal inspection procedures, underwater structures were inspected by divers, often working in total darkness and using only their sense of touch. The scheme lies on the main road to Oban and the west coast, a popular tourist route in summer. Only road access to the site was available from Glasgow and the industrial south by two main approach routes. In spite of bridge and culvert strengthening, restrictions to a maximum of 80 tons meant breaking down some of the heavier units into subunits suitable for the journey. One. The picturesque route along Loch Lomond side passing the earlier Loch Sloy power station The other, no less romantic, by Stirling and a three-mile climb up Glen Ogle, the gradient averaging one in 25. With the larger pieces, there was little room for error in navigating the portal entrance and proceeding down the tunnel. <laughs> Unless you were in a hurry.
The spiral casings were the first large-scale pieces reassembled in the machine hall. The halves are bolted together again, and the casings are pressure tested once more. The support barrels for the generators are added. The low setting of the machines and a surge chamber high enough to drain to the lock require long draft tubes rising 130 feet from the lowest levels. These are lined with steel sections 10 feet in diameter, welded together inside rock tunnels. Eleven hundred feet long and one hundred and fifty feet maximum height, the total volume of the dam is one hundred and fifteen thousand cubic yards. The storage on Den Kruichen behind a dam such as this was once considered suitable for twenty-five megawatts of conventional generation. The pump storage principle allows it to support four hundred megawatts. In order that the 200,000 tons of concrete for the dam could be placed in two summer seasons, both Derrick Crane and Cableway delivery systems were employed. The buttresses are set at 50-foot centers and have a minimum thickness of 15 feet, with elliptical downstream surfaces between the stems. Strain gauges are placed in the dam to monitor stresses developing in the concrete. Ten million tons of water will be impounded behind this dam, representing 8.3 million units of electricity. The control gates, built up in sections, besides the normal function of withstanding the static head of the reservoir, are required to withstand on the other side the maximum pumping head. They are also required to close by gravity against the maximum flow from the reservoir, and to be incapable of closing to more than three-quarters shut against the maximum pumping flow to the reservoir. The profile of the gates ensures that the hydraulic loads will be the optimum to assist gravity closure and positive seating under conditions of maximum head and flow from the reservoir. Some 350 yards from the foot of the dam and situated above the transformer hall area emerges a 1,200-foot shaft which combines the functions of ventilation and main cable duct. This shaft is lined with pre-cast concrete rings 13-foot internal diameter. These rings are partitioned and provide two ducts for the two cable circuits and to lead air down to the ventilation plant in the cavern and a third to contain an access stairway. As we have seen, snow is no stranger to the area. It was only a coincidence of readiness and weather that conspired a winter setting for the ceremony of closing the gates in the new dam to begin the impounding of the upper reservoir. From under the rock barrier, the water began to accumulate. The filling of the reservoir by natural means including the diversions to it from the catchment system, would take nine months. Alt Kruachen, the stream of the mountain, was on its way to create an artificial loch of 120 acres. The valve units at the lower end of the high pressure shafts are of the spherical or rotary type, designed for water pressure servo motor operation. 
Assembly in the relatively confined space of the lower levels of the machine hall was highly skilled work, calling for accuracy and patience. At the upper levels, the assembly of the generators was advanced by installation of the rotors. The rotors, 200 tons of precision engineering, were lowered carefully by two cranes into the stator bores. Only the cylindrical pony motors and exciters are seen on entering the station. The two transformers were, uniquely, rebuilt on site. The core and windings were reassembled inside a plastic tent inflated by filtered air above atmospheric pressure. The tank was added in sections and the transformer oil dried under vacuum and impulse tested. This method of installation was another notable first for Kruachen. The high voltage oil filled cables which descend from the outdoor ceiling ends at the head of the vertical shaft are fitted wave fashion to wall cleats in groups of three. This provides for longitudinal expansion. Before sealing off the lower termination at the high pressure stop joints, the cables were partly drained to reduce the hydrostatic pressure. After jointing, the cables were refilled. On completion of the long and complex construction program, the commissioning tests were begun. Numerous interlocks and fail-safe devices are proved, and the operations, which later will be fully automatic, are carefully set by hand, with temporary instrumentation watched and controlled at turbine and generator level, repeated and adjusted until the best conditions and the shortest times are achieved. rest, the machines can be generating their full capacity in about two minutes. Pumping can be in full operation in about eight minutes. And a reversal of function may be carried out in about nine minutes. In the condition known as spinning reserve, that is, synchronized with the water in the chamber blown down, a machine can be fully loaded and delivering its rated output in just over one minute. was now ready for the formal inauguration of the new power station, a ceremony graciously performed by Her Majesty the Queen. Referring to the advances made in the development of electricity supply systems, Her Majesty drew particular attention to the lead in reversible high-head pump turbines which the achievement at Kruachen represents. peak load comes, Kruachen is there. The turn of a button commands 400 megawatts of power, unhurried but instant from its upper waters. In idle hours, at night and at the weekend, cheap energy to spare puts the water back. The hard-won experience gained at Kruachen in design and construction and in operation 
is already being used in developing further projects on an even greater scale in Britain and across the sea. Even in lands where natural hydropower is scarce, the low cost and high flexibility of pump storage are there for the taking. There is an old name with a new meaning for men to remember, Kruachan. I want you to do it again for the whole town, tonight in the Big Top. Tonight? Me? In the Big Top? Sure. Circus Town loves a new trick, especially one as funny. 